Hello. Hello. Is it over? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope that was a really kind introduction. I didn't understand anything. I can just say didn't over. Uh, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, pleased to be here. Uh, it's really beautiful here. I, I brought my whole family actually here. Uh, my happy kids, my wife, even my dog. Um, it's a fun time for us here. Uh, so many friendly people. Everybody helps us because we don't speak so much <laughs> um, So uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I uh, would like to talk about AI. Uh, it's a fun thing for me. I, um, I'm in the AI space for eight years, roughly. Um, have been doing nothing else at AI for the last eight years. I have a software engineering background, so I'm kind of an alien in the hardware space. Um, so I often have a different approach on how I position these kind of things. I don't start from the bottom uh, with, with hardware layers and then make my way to the top, but I rather start at the top, lead with um, value, right? Uh, what, what's the business value? AI can bring into the business, and then I can dig deeper into how you actually provide solutions for AI, for instance, based on live and uh, I'm leaving that topic these days worldwide. Um, I'm in essentially an offering management team. I still have a technical focus, though. So I'm, for instance, leading work on uh, creating demos for uh, for that topic. And um, for that reason, I'd also like to start with one of um, one of the demos I created um, a few months back for the Tech Exchange conference in Barcelona. So uh, for the Tech Exchange, I got like an email um, shown here. Uh, it was quite long. I'm always busy. Uh, I don't like to read long emails, so I created a demo where I summarized the contents of the demo. Uh, well, here you see the email, congratulations, yes, you made it to the conference, you have some here. I let an AI generate um, uh, a summary of that. Um, that's an example of what AI can do today. It can work with text really, really, really well. So it creates a summary for it. It can also extract information out of text, like, like the topic here, um, that um, needs to be worked on. Um, and. Well, this is what everybody understands by generative AI. It can generate something new, for instance, text. Right? And lots of people have seen that in the context of ChatGPT, for instance. Um, I explain my mother these days what I'm doing professionally. Um, she finally understands. <laughs> um, so that has helped. Um, once I arrived at that conference here, I also thought of making it a great experience for all the participants at the conference. So what I was doing then, uh, I was creating like a chatbot, a digital concierge, I called it, uh, where you can ask questions about the conference and then uh, the AI will generate answers to that. So uh, here, that was the place of the conference. Who uh, was talking about generative AI and power? That was me, I'm surprised. Um, I can even ask private questions about myself. I like to play the guitar in position. So, um, next round, if you want to chat about that, cool. Um, you can also talk about dogs. Um, so, the, the important thing here is that's another example of generative AI. It can provide you answers to your questions. But what I did here is uh, I tailored it to a specific domain. In this particular case, it was a conference, and I tailored it to myself. Uh, so, um, so what we can learn here is um, there are ways that you can use this technology for your own domain, your own business context, if you will. <coughs> and uh, it has become really easy to, to do that these days. So it, uh, creating a demo like that takes me, I think, an hour or two. Um, to, to arrive at such a result. It's maybe not perfect yet, right? But if that is a proof of concept or a minimal viable product you can showcase in just two hours of your time, uh, that's incredible, right? Because AI projects used to run for years and often failed, right? But that has changed with the advent of ChatGPT because it has become so easy to adapt this kind of technologies. Uh, so, the big game changer here, um, <coughs> where foundation models, I'll show you um, how we, uh, I incorporated that into my demo. 
So this is like a behind the scenes now. Um, how did I set this up? Um, so I created a UI where you can ask uh, questions and get answers. Uh, in the back end, there is a lookup happening. So based on the question, I, the system moves to some kind of database, a knowledge base, that I pre-populated with some domain-specific information. So you can populate it with PDFs, you can attach your ERP system, uh, you can attach it to web pages, you can even attach it to other models that do forecasting, and then you get information out of that. I'll later on have some more examples on that. Uh, in my particular case, I uh, populated that knowledge base with information about the conference in Barcelona and about myself. You know that I like to play the guitar, blue eyes, and like Italian food. And um, based on the question I asked, I next get um, the, the most relevant documents out of that knowledge base. So I ask, okay, what's the location? Find some piece of text in this knowledge base that includes the address, and that's the output of this kind of search. Think of it as, as like a non-prem Google search, if you will. Right? Um, that's not the end. I take the, the question I asked, I added the relevant documents to it, and then, then I pass it on to something called a large language model or foundation model. Um, in my example, I use Flama 2. Um, that's a fairly popular foundation model, comes from Meta. There are, are other models um, from IBM, the Granny series, for instance, uh, Flama is from Google. Um, so I took one of those models, deployed it on, a, on my Power 10 machine, and then I just gave it the question and the relevant documents. These models have the generic capability to read and understand the question, read through the documents, and then they can generate a natural language answer. And you don't have to change the model at all. You just download it, deploy it, and use it. And that was the game changer I was talking about. Because you used to have a whole fleet of data scientists for engineering these kind of models. <coughs> and nowadays, it has become a situation where you download it, deploy it, and use it. Right? But the only thing for, for domain adaptation you have to do is set up some system like that that follows this pattern here for augmenting uh, the model with everything that is domain specific. So you don't have to retrain or, or, or train models anymore. You use them and augment them with your domain specific data. Quickly pause here. Is there a question on that? Is that roughly clear? Okay, cool. So um, this has become the de facto standard in industry, how to set up systems on generative AI, because it has this advantage of, advantage of simplicity. Um, it has some other advantages, for instance, if you're heard of um, hallucination effects in generative AI. So these kind of models sometimes have the problem that they come up with facts that are actually not true. Right, that's called hallucination. So they provide fake answers to people. Mm -hmm. um, so by setting up a system like that, you can actually enforce that the, the model is only allowed to create answers based on the knowledge that is here. So it, as long as the, the, the knowledge that is in the knowledge base is factual and true, we will ensure that hallucination is probably avoided to a higher degree. Right? So um, that's an advantage. So the other advantage has been, I'll put that into context with Power 10, for instance, is that everything you see here can be deployed on Power 10 today, uh, and it's uh, so fast that you can use it in practical context. Okay, and the, the reason that this is fast is with the advent of Power 10, we had a strong focus on inferencing, so making the deployment of models and the usage of those models really efficient by, for instance, accelerating uh, inferencing on the chip. So each power 10 chip, if you have a power 10 chip, will accelerate these kind of deployments so you have a reasonable response time, essentially, when setting up systems like that. So you have this kind of real-time experience you, you want to have when you chat with, with a chatbot, for instance. Um, you also stack optimization, you have SIMD units on the chip, you have a high bandwidth, all these things factor into the, the performance. <coughs> We get on board then. Okay. Okay. Um, 
have a quick look on this, this topic on foundation models. Um, so foundation models have been trained on a massive amount of data. So, um, and uh, any kind of data, essentially. So mainly text from the internet, but um, companies have also started tran transpiling er, er, um, <coughs> from audio and video data, the text, and then feeding those large language models and foundation models further. <coughs> Um, they have become really big. Um, they have become so big that only a few big players essentially have the <laughs> capability to train them because you need 12 compute firms with lots of GPUs um, for, for getting to those models. Um, but once you, you, you manage to do that, you can not only solve one task but actually multiple <coughs> tasks. The most well known foundation models <coughs> are the NLP space, so natural language processing, reading, understanding text, generating text. That's, that's the, the main capability we have here. And um, there are different subcategories <coughs> of working with text. So you can have the Q&A example, like in my, uh, my demo with the summarization <coughs> task, extracting information out of text. It's a, a task that can be solved quite well, uh, generically resolved models. Um, Further down, you can see also something interesting, interesting code generation. Um, if you think of IBM Z, for instance, uh, that it's really popular that there is like a uh, transformation from COBOL code to Java code that's also backed by this kind of technology. Uh, but you can also generate JUnit tests, for instance, so test cases for your code. Um, if you don't like to write documentation, one well, can be generated these days using this <laughs> kind of technology yeah so um, <coughs> the, the value behind of that is essentially you want to become more productive in what you're doing right so um, that's what these tasks help you with depending on on your context here are some stats um, from analysts that showcase that um, well that the advantage led to a situation um, that, that this kind of Generative AI technology is on the, the agenda of lots of CEOs these days. Because it's so easy, you immediately get value, essentially. You become more productive in your everyday tasks um, for all the advantages. I think most of them I, I already mentioned. Um, are I, I'd like to continue with some more examples so that so you understood more in power context what that means for you. So here, I, uh, one of my clients um, in manufacturing, they have a ERP system on IBM I. What they do these days is, and they get a choice in logistics, so they often get quotes by their end customers. They want to transfer a good A uh, from, from point A to point B, and want to get an offer for that. Right? So when they get an email, uh, a large language model is processing this email these days, extracting the information out of it um, that, that is needed. So it's logistics information, what's the destination address, what, what's the origin address, what are the quantities of the product you want to uh, transfer, what, what's the actual product. Right? So th this kind of information can be automatically extracted from the email. Used to be do, done manually. Um, now, there's still a human in the loop as of today. So there's like a service employee that um, checks whether everything is okay. And uh, if everything is okay, they put it into the ERP system on IBM I. Uh, based on that information, um, the final step is essentially the service employee then can decide to create half automatically, if you will, an offer that is then sent to their end customer. Okay. So uh, compared to the first example I've shown, where I filled the, the on-prem system with data and got data out. This is also kind of the other way around here, where I get external data and I process it automatically using generative AI to put something into my ERP system. That's, if you will, a pattern here. You, you, you see really often. Uh, let's have a look at another example. So here, um, that's uh, a client that, um, where we work with the IT administration department. They have lots of log files in their IT system, millions of logs daily, essentially. They're interested in essentially proactive maintenance or predictive maintenance. So um, when they're interested when incidents will happen or if an incident happens, what's the root cause of it and how to go about it. 
So um, they built actually a classical machine learning model with these logs. So that's not Gen AI, that's classical stuff. Right? Um, in this particular instance, they're using so called um, KNN models, uh, <coughs> nearest neighbors, um, classical algorithm. Um, that's also nicely working on Power 10. You can train and, and use those algorithms natively on Power 10. Um, for these kind of algorithms, there's not even a benefit of using GPUs. So that's some kind of sweet spot on power. And lots of customers are using that today. So if I talk to banking customers, they all do fraud analysis or money laundering analysis already since ages, essentially. So that's often the context where we, we start with. Um, but what this customer now did is um, they, they got out of this machine learning algorithm different log categories and the quantities there, but it was still gibberish for, it, for them. So they, they didn't know how to interpret it. So what they did is they now took a large language foundation model and they let this model generate a report on how to interpret the output of the, the classic machine learning model. And they also came up with steps how to go about potential issues in their infrastructure. Okay, so every 15 minutes they get, or for instance, an email that gives them a report and says, like, look, this looks suspicious. <coughs> Step one for you could be to log into, I don't know, vSphere and check this category of logs in for that host system. Please check whether everything is okay, and then they, they, they do that these days, and it has helped them to become really, really, really productive. So that's that's an in-production system, uh, fully automated, if you will. This, this discovery and um, helps them saving hours um, every day. Um, so, just a quick summary here. So another pattern we we commonly see is you are in the classical domain where you. you use something like yeah, and and your, right? take anything else, logistic regressions, decision trees, uh, forecasting algorithm, time series analysis. So often customers are already using that, but now they are expanding this old <coughs> AI world to the new <laughs> AI world by um, enriching their old use cases with Gen AI. Gen AI use cases are often different than the classical ones. So you cannot do a fraud detection with Gen AI, but you can enrich it. And here's a second example from that. So that's now banking. Um, talk about transactions here. So customer goes to an ATM machine, swipes his credit card. Uh, machine learning model these days um, will analyze it and say or flag transactions for potential frauds. Right? So they might say, well, this looks fraudulent. Huge amount of money. Um, never transfer to this country might be a suspicious country, don't know, right? So that might be a fraud. Um, so what we can now do, um, expand on those use cases. So we, we can let, again, a large language model analyze this output of the classical machine learning model, and for instance, um, create a fraud report for a business analyst that doesn't know anything about data science, because again, the output of the machine learning model might be just gibberish for the, for, for the poor business analyst, right? But, but with, with uh, Gen AI, you can now um, create reports in the lingo of the business, right? And not in the lingo of technical mm -hmm. data scientists. Okay. Make sense? No complaints? <laughs> I'm not hallucinating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, so, um, let me give you some more in-depth look into how we train these days the classical machine learning models because we, we also expanded on, on that. So classic machine learning still plays a role. The banking example it was a classical machine learning algorithm that essentially flagged for us for being fraudulent. Um, if, so the example setup I have here now shows how we can actually come to these models and deploy them on a, on a power system. Um, I just took an example out of many. So in this example, uh, I deployed an Oracle database on an AIX LPAR. Um, have the same setup also for an IBM I system with DB2 um, working. And um, the credit card transactions are essentially stored there. Um, there is some <coughs> kind of historic part of transactions that have been already flagged, being fraudulent or not. 
Um, so what I can do is um, on a on a Linux or a sidecar. That's where my data science portfolio lives for classical machine learning. Uh, I can connect to that LPAR, may I ask, extension to Oracle. Um, Primus is a connector technology supporting over 30 plus uh, connections to different databases. So DB2 for I, DB2, Oracle, MongoDB, Postgres, you name it. Um, so this is how I ingest the data. Um, it's open source here, the tag, tag I use. When I do data science magic um, here, so training a model that does classical machine learning, I export it to a format called Onyx. That's a model format. It's like the PDF for data science, right? So we an exchange format, if you will. And um, this is something I can then natively deploy to AIX, for instance. Could also deploy it on the Linux sidecar. Some customers are happy with that. Some customers want to have it in their holy AX or IBM My Castle. So um, there, there we have some nuances on, on, on how we deploy models. So in this example, I deployed it here directly where the data, where the transactions live, and that gives it uh, some speed up, speed up in especially real-time detection use cases. So think of a customer swipes his credit card into an ATM machine. Um, you only have a few milliseconds to check whether it's Roland or not, because you want to book the transaction into your system, essentially, right? <laughs> so it has to be really fast here. And that's the reason you might want to really deploy close to those transactions so you can save latencies. Um, then there are other advantages you get when you bring it as close as that to transactions. So um, the, the attack vector vote for hackers, for instance, becomes smaller. Um, the, the architecture might become simpler because you don't have to call out of the AX helper and then make it be deployed there. Um, so th this is something um, we, we have done multiple times for especially for classical machine learning where you have this kind of training aspect that you need a whole data science portfolio on the right hand side. Um, the, the data science uh, portfolio here in this instance um, has the advantage that it's actually 100% automated. Right, so step one to three, you, you hit a play button and it runs it automatically again, maybe based on new training data. So you get a new model version, and it's automatically deployed into your production system based on what some kind of quality tests will tell you here. Right? So if the new model is better, let's deploy it in production. If it's not better, let's throw it away. Try again. Right? Um, but that's completely automated. Um, it's got ML ops, machine learning operations here. Um, that's kind of the death of our data science world here. Uh, but that's also something we, we have available um, currently in our open source stack. Um, I'll later on talk a bit about our enterprise stack and where we are there with MLOps. Um, but that's, if you will, MLOps, automating the whole process. So you can version it, you can test it, um, you can easily onboard new data scientists that have never worked on that before because they just have to play it, push a play button essentially. Um, I was talking about code generation. So here's an example for Ansible uh, for generative AI, uh, created by my colleague Joe Kropa. Um, so um, Ansible is for IT automation, setting up IT environments. And um, you, in this example, that's uh, an Ansible playbook where it's applied to all hosts, so all known servers in my infrastructure. And uh, the nice thing here is I import a so called collection for IBMI. So I load kind of IBM I specific features into into this, <coughs> this the system here, and um, then tasks IT tasks start. So task one uh, create an SQL query I think run an SQL query. Um, now a magic AI button is hit and it generates you a template on how this task would actually look like. It used to be called code completion, but this is kind of code completion plus plus. So creating a template um, that gives you like a head start. So we can start really quickly on the task. Uh, here's the second example, execute the SQL query. Again, the, de uh, the, the developer here can hit the generate button. It gets a code stamp. In this case, it, uh, the, the developer just accepts it. And um, there you go, you really quickly generated the task you, you want to go for. You can adapt it if you want to, of course. Right? So it um, might be not 100% complete, but it's better than always going to the web and Googling for, you know, code stuffs for these kind of tasks. 
create an uh, AAS, uh, IASP, so if I got this view attached to your IBM I system. Um, again, this task can be generated. I, I got this graph before. Right? Um, so um, this is called Ample Lightspeed. Um, that's available as a service, if you will. That does not run on power, but you can generate artifacts for power. Right? So here you're like um, an Ansible developer. Um, the environment you see here, that's Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Um, there's a plugin for Visual Studio Code that developers install on their laptops, and then in the back end they can connect to the service that gives them this capability here. Right? And that is hosted by, by Red Hat, the service. Um, we continue to enrich it with our specific features. So this was an IMI example. Uh, we also have examples for uh, we have a management console, we have examples for AIX, um, and, and a few others. Do you need a license for Copilot? Okay. You don't need a Copilot license, but you need a subscription for Ansible Lightspeed. So that's a, that's a cloud service. Um, Ansible Lightspeed in itself uses um, Watson X code assistant in the back end. Right. You look in the architecture of it. I mean, the, the de developer wouldn't know, but eventually it boils down to there is some kind of foundation model. Um, that's one of the IBM running models that generates that for code. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's how the magic happens essentially in the back end. Right? And uh, what, what we do for these kind of use cases, I have to say they are no, no law hanging fruits. Generating code is more of a tougher discipline than generating these <coughs> digital concierges in my demos. Right? So for these kind of mm -hmm. demos, or, or think of the, the, the Cobalt to Java translation, mm -hmm. you need lots of training data. Right? And uh, we provide this training data. So we, we pay a bunch of developers for creating this, this data so we can train these models to be as accurate as, as that. And then we, we distribute them using these collections, right? So the, the best is a bit higher than for other AI use cases. And that's often something we, we see in general, right? So there are all those low hanging fruits. That's where we, we recommend workshops. Run a POC with us, and in a few weeks you, you, you can get real results, right? Um, this is the use case where we say, well, we take it on a worldwide level, we, we provide it generically for everybody on the on the earth, right? And then then we deliver it. But that might be a, a difference here in, in J AI space. Okay. Is that answer the question? So um, quick summary here on what I've shown so far. So um, here are different patterns on how to go on AI and on power. Um, so one pattern I keep using is I download generic foundation models, I deploy them on power, and I use them. It's become really easy to do that. Right? So it takes me a few minutes um, to, to, to do that, essentially. Um, we have the partnership with the Hugging Face, it's the biggest, biggest repository uh, for models um, that mm -hmm. exist today. So they are mentioned more than half a million models currently. Um, so uh, that's something we can do today on power. Um, then we can enrich our applications. So I, I used a simple UI here, but think of applications also as your applications, applications you run in IBM I or AIX. And we have SDKs that make it easy for application developers to connect to models deployment power. So you have like a sim simple interface. Then we have some <coughs> capabilities for classical machine learning, which is still relevant, as my examples have shown. Uh, I've shown how to set up an architecture with open source <coughs> thus far. There's also the variant to use our enterprise portfolio. Um, Topic for data in particular for that. And topic for, for data, I, I find it always good to, to mention this auto AI, really small <laughs> level at the upper left, but it's a data scientist in a box in charge. So you, you, you instruct auto AI to train, automatically train a model um, based on the data set you provide. So you, you, you essentially tell it, look at the data set and predict with this column in my, my, my database. And then it learns how to predict a particular column. Um, and that gives you another speed up on your 
uh, when you want to go into production uh, with AI workloads here, machine learning is an example. So still relevant um, and um, once really nice on power 10, um, again, GPUs don't help in classic machine learning. Um, you plug in a GPU into your server to get the speed up and you, you, the, the speed up you measure is exactly zero. Um, because those kind of algorithms are not GPU bound, it's deep learning networks that are GPU bound only. Um, so, um, the other topic uh, is our ecosystem. Um, I highlighted that the light speed, that's part of our ecosystem for power, that helps you um, working on AI on power. Um, so, there are some other ecosystem elements, um, and we work closely with SAP. Um, because Power has a strong SAP focus uh, to onboard further, further capabilities. Um, we, we recently released on the SDK. Um, I was mentioning here my second pattern, also for ABAP applications. So uh, if you're an ABAP developer, you can easily connect to foundation models that, for instance, run on power. But you can also um, deploy those models in the cloud if you want to. And um, this, this um, SDK for ABAP essentially enables you just by changing the endpoint of your model to connect to the cloud if you want to, right? So um, often we have customers that start their journey in the cloud, they host their model for instance in the cloud and just connect their applications to the cloud. Um, lots of customers, if they want to go from experimentation to production, they set against the cloud then. Um, so that's where then they start deploying it on, on power, and then they just change the endpoint from the cloud endpoint to the on-prem endpoint to um, power. That's kind of easy. It's just a simple switch to, 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 um, to use on that. Um, Desi and Elinar are, are two partners um, of our ecosystem. They uh, help. They are like a model factory for you. So some customers have really sensitive data and the need for training on that data their models, so to re-scaler it to their own use cases. And um, that's where Elinar, for instance, would come in-house and create tailor-made models for those customers. They are often working in sensitive, critical contexts, like government, banking, insurances, things like that. Um, and what both Desi and Elinar do, they also optimize for Power 10. So they will use all the nice features, see the full software stack optimization we have um, to get you an additional speed up here. Um, the funny thing is when you start tailoring your large language models even for, for a specific domain or use case, they tend to become smaller. So um, a smaller model means you get a better response for it while having good accuracy. Uh, here are a few further examples um, of customers that follow these patterns. Right? Um, so um, the first example off the left, it's a hospital chain in Thailand. Um, they, they have a pathology department. Um, in the pathology department, they get human tissues, and they analyze it for, for things like cancer. Right? And so, in the first step, they do some kind of visual anal analysis. They, they take the human tissue and look at it, right? And then they, they, um, then they make some notes and, and write down what they see. So, these days, they use um, microphones for that. They listen to what they, the pathologists speak. And um, that, this is then um, transpiled into text automatically. Um, again, that, that is using a foundation model for speech to text translations, and um, that's also also from Power 10 here. Um, and this way they can automatically write down um, what, what, what they are seeing. That if leads to a situation where they become quicker, you know, you know, they can now process more patients in time, essentially. So that's one aspect. They also do computer vision analytics, so they also digitally analyze um, the, the human tissue, the tissues once it's digitalized. Um, the models for that, they create on GPUs, but they do want to be for power 10 machines uh, because of the sensitivity of the data they receive. In addition to cost of factors. Um, Spectrum Consulting in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand has really strict data sovereignty requirements. Um, public entities are not allowed to upload anything in the cloud. 
So yeah. they have to host any everything essentially on premises, and that's also something where where Power Ten shines. And essentially, they they, they use something similar that I showed in my demos. So they have a, a chatbot for public entities created on Power Ten. The retailer on our left, um, they train millions of models per day. Um, for each retail product um, in their retail stores, they essentially have a set of models they train continuously, if you will. Um, so they did some kind of hyper optimization for every product. Um, they are using time series forecasting for that. That's again classic machine learning. Again, that has a nice speed up on power 10. Um, and because the key metric for them is how many models can I train and use per second, um, they moved to power 10, actually from a power 9 GPU accelerated system. So if you still remember the 1892s we used to have, they migrated off from these for getting a speed up for this kind of workload. Um, the financial institution, the last example here, um, it also combines, or it's another example or another instance where you see that classical machine learning is relevant. That's what they are doing. That's their power 10 context, even if you will. Um, but now they are expanding from that context to generative AI and start enriching their existing use cases. Um, it's this new kind of technology. Okay. Um, so why do all of those customers go for Power 10? Um, we bought it down to three most important values we provide on, on Power. That's the acceleration we provide, while it's time to see control you have when orchestrating AI workloads, control where and how you want to create AI workloads, and it's safeguarding AI and data. So keeping your sensitive data, your mission critical workloads safe. These are the main values. More details on each of those. So on the first point, we, by acceleration, we mean both hardware and software optimization, and accelerating also via the ecosystem we have. That brings you really quickly to the value you need. Um, for the hardware and software optimization, we also have some proof points here that talk about um, how the throughput increase you get when you use large language models on power 10, um, the watts, so the power consumption you save and you deploy it on, on Power 10. And we also did a total cost of ownership analysis here. Um, for that, we deployed it on, um, or we deployed a topic for data on Power, which gives you roughly 50% um, better price performance. So, for the orchestration part, we talk a lot about hybrid, as IBM does everywhere, right? So, hybrid capabilities giving you the control on when you want to go to a cloud, when you want to go on-premises, doing that seamlessly without you having to set up two distinct systems, making that really easy to consume, that um, uh, high focus, IBM in general. Uh, flexibility also means um, enabling you to select the right tools for your context. So if you're in open source, we provide you even enterprise support for open source. So you can create architectures that are even purely based on open source. Um, if you want to go for the enterprise portfolio for um, maybe regulatory reasons, that's also something we want to fully support and anything in between as well. So you can make some match it to your domain how you want to go about your use cases, right? So lots of customers have context in open source or in open source databases and we, we want to give you the flexibility to um, continue doing so but enriching it with enterprise features like enterprise support. <coughs> so we provide you 24-7 support for open source even so you can file tickets and become compliant to your requirements in your company. Um, Safeguarding data means full stack security for us. So um, in AI, there are some particularities about that. So um, AI models need to be trained, so they see data, the data might be sensitive, that needs to be protected for that reason. If you deploy a model, again, data is fed into the model, and that needs to be protected. We have some capabilities <coughs> that help you in, in this endeavor. So, for instance, full memory encryption, safe guards, uh, these kind of workloads from side channel and text. Um, then we have also accelerators that help you encrypting it without uh, performance penalty. Right. So, these are the things that factor in. Uh, I hope most of you are in, a, in the IT admin space, probably. Um, 
probably um, not so many data scientists here. Um, so I think those values are most well known for all our customers. Also when we talk about reliability, availability, things like that, um, that's, we, we continue to have a strong focus on that. Right? And continue to improve here. And um, that's, again, the, the topic of AI. AI benefits from that, especially if AI becomes part of your mission critical workloads. You don't want that deployed model then just shuts down, becomes unaware of this. Uh, and your, your mission critical application, your, your core business essentially goes down. So, this is what this is all about. Okay, um, so I'm going to skip the reference here, talk about that. Um, how much time do I have left? One minute? Okay. Okay, here's the stack, we talked about it. I've seen a lot. Flexibility starts here with OpenShift and uh, selecting an alpha native deployment. I think that's the key, key piece in, in um, the flexibility. <laughs> Often we start proof of concepts natively on LPARs because if you um, are not yet on OpenShift, you don't want to enforce that you directly start with OpenShift when you want to run AI. We want to make that really easy for you to start and experiment with. And after so success with BLC, we, we then can talk about moving you on top of open shift, for instance, onboarding into open source portfolios or, or the enterprise mm -hmm. portfolio. Okay? Um, the topic for data portfolio is a bunch of components we enabled on power. That's today. Tomorrow um, should be what is planned is to um, also enable data stage, either knowledge catalogs, what's the pipelines, what, uh, what's the open scale topic for data that's coming next. And um, in the what's next portfolio, um, again, it's a stack of different components. Um, it turns out several of those components are already part of the topic for data. So those components already run on power, and um, the focus we have next on what's next is to especially enable Red Hat OpenShift AI, which is a, it's a kind of a prerequisite for de deploying models in the What's Next context. So we have a strong focus here, um, plus the What's Next governance, all the scale is relevant, um, What's the pipeline for the product of What's Next of AI. So that is on the roadmap. We have a priority on enabling that. Okay. The last slide, slide. Uh, I'll speak now. <coughs> Um, so what you've seen here is essentially the middle column. I, I, I gave you a quick briefing on AI. Um, what we really recommend, essentially, every customer who's not yet, yet super crisp on the use cases to run use case alignment workshops with us. Because uh, it matters, so if you want to succeed <coughs> in AI, it really matters that you get a, a use case that is one low-hanging fruit and not a moonshot project. Uh, otherwise, the likelihood of failing is really high. So you need to have a low hanging fruit and combine it with high value. So um, go for a use case that provides maximum value. And we help you um, with, a, uh, with a professional team to find those kind of use cases. So we run user quality design thinking workshops. Right? So um, we run those workshops also for IBMI uh, power customers and they are free of charge. Because we strongly believe that this is the only way of being successful. Okay. So, thank you very much for thinking with me, here with me.